do you remember Lufia? Well, I do. In fact, I'm a big fan of Lufia 2 Rise of the Sinistrals in the Super Nintendo, so I've always wondered why aren't they making any Lufia games anymore nowadays? We're here exactly to find out why today. Alright, let's begin! Neverland Company Incorporated was founded in 1993 as a video game development team. They wanted to make a traditional RPG that very same year. Once they did, it was called Estpolis Denki, translated as Biography of Estpolis. When it was brought to North America by Taito, the title was changed to Lufia and the Fortress of Doom. This may have happened because the name Estpolis lacked appeal and was difficult to pronounce or understand for North Americans. Therefore, Taito believed that the name of the female heroine, Lufia, will be easier to market. The game was also going to be released for the Sega Genesis, but was ultimately cancelled. It was never released in Europe. Lufia and the Fortress of Doom is a turn-based RPG with character sprites in 2D, dungeon crawling elements and mainly random encounters. These encounters, however, proved to be very frequent in the game and the fact that you couldn't choose a specific enemy to attack, but rather a group of enemies instead, threw the game into harsh criticism. Despite this, the charm, story and gameplay mechanics gave it noteful recognition, but ultimately failed against other RPGs at the time, like Secret of Mana or the Final Fantasy titles. Nevertheless, it was enough for Neverland to continue on with the series. Estpolis Denki 2, or rather Lufia 2 Rise of the Sinistrals, was also released for the Super Nintendo on 1995 in Japan. However, Taito of America had closed its doors there and it was localized to North America by Natsume the following year but it wouldn't arrive in Europe until 1997 as the first title in the series, simply called Lufia. This presented no issues since the game was a prequel to the original Lufia. The game combined all elements from its predecessor into perfection. Encounter rate dropped to normal, puzzles and dungeons were more reasonably challenging and the story was deeper with more insight this time. It also included several new features such as the option to avoid battles inside dungeons and slide roguelike elements to make navigation smoother. It was a commercial success, not even overshadowed by other giant titles such as Super Mario RPG or Chrono Trigger. Lufia 2 stood on its own and brought the franchise into a bright future full of possibilities. To date, it stands as one of the best RPGs on the system and a cult classic to never forget. During the following years, Neverland became uncertain on what to do with the franchise. Lufia 2 had been successful, yes, but not as much as they were expecting. Or rather, how much both Taito and Natsume were expecting as their publishers. So instead of working on a new title, Neverland began developing other RPGs for the Super Famicom in 1996 that eventually were never released outside Japan. A couple of years later, it was revealed that another company called Nihon Flex was finally working on Lufia 3 and it was going to be called Lufia Ruins Chaser, still within the same universe as the others, as a canon title for the PlayStation. The company, however, went out of business by the late 90s, so Taito gave the rights back to Neverland, who picked up the project and turned it into a Game Boy Color exclusive called Lufia The Legend Returns. It was released in 2001 on all territories, still published in Japan by Taito, Natsume in North America, but this time by Ubisoft in Europe. Story was completely rewritten, 
new characters were added and graphics were significantly downgraded. And even though some gameplay mechanics were similar to previous titles in the series, it looked and played remarkably different, making it seem more like a spin-off than a canon title. Nevertheless, it was Luffy 3 through and through, but criticism, questions and uncertainty began immediately after its release. First of all, who was this Nihon Flex company? And most importantly, why was it involved with Luffy in the first place? However, yet another big question was, why was the series being taken to a portable system? Confusion began and combining the lack of success of Luffy 3, Neverland dropped the series. Natsume withdrew temporarily and took them to work on other titles, including Sima the Enemy for the Game Boy Advance. Taito, however, kept the rights to Lufia and decided to hire a new company called Atelier Double to develop a spin-off also for the Game Boy Advance in 2002. The title was called Lufia The Ruins of Lore. Atlus published this game in North America the following year, but it was never released in Europe. Loosely based on the events of Lufia 2, taking place 20 years after it, this spin-off focused more on a quest-driven adventure and much less mature story than Lufia 2, but still with similar gameplay mechanics and a fun battle system. It was ironically successful, but with sales still kept to a minimum, finally disappointing Taito the following years. With Neverland gone from Taito's strings and no other publishers interested in the franchise, Estepolis Denki's future became completely uncertain once again. In 2005, Neverland went on to work with Sega on the PlayStation 2 with Shining Force Neo, years after the original developer of the series, Camelot Software Planning, had given up on it. They also released Shining Force EXA two years later, both titles being released only in Japan and North America. Since none of them met Sega's expectations and criticism was harsh, Neverland moved on to continue with their newly successful series, Rune Factory a spin-off of the Harvest Moon series established since 2006. Lufia wouldn't return until 2010 when Square Enix approached Neverland to take advantage of what little success Lufia 2 Rise of the Sinistrals had back in the day. They wanted to remake the game, but with a full reimagination of its gameplay mechanics. Driven by their own nostalgia, in a last attempt to revive the series, Neverland agreed and, along with Square Enix, developed Lufia Curse of the Sinistrals for the Nintendo DS. Square published it in Japan, but Natsume, who still had the rights in North America, published it there. No version was ever released anywhere else. This remake, however, was an action RPG, very similar to the East series, with only one character being able to fight in a hack and slash mechanic. Graphic and character design were very well done and overall, the game looked beautiful. As an action RPG, still filled with puzzles and dungeon crawling mechanics that characterized the Lufia series, it was welcomed by new gamers and succeeded in that regard. Sadly, the reality was far from being positive. It only sold 14,000 copies in Japan and original Lufia fans trashed the game with harsh criticism. Time went on with less and less people interested in buying this drastic reboot. Both Natsume and Square Enix noticed this and closed the doors. Three years later, Neverland Company filed for bankruptcy and most of its employees were hired by Marvelous AQL to continue working with the Room Factory series, along with other titles such as Lord of Magna Made in Heaven for the 3DS. The Lufia series, however, vanish into oblivion, probably forever. I think it's pretty obvious what happened to Lufia. We've seen this so many times with lots of franchises and developers when different publishers get involved. Bad decisions are made, games aren't successful. Yeah, same old situation. One of the stupidest things they did, in my opinion, was not taking full advantage of the success of Lufia 2, giving the rights to this Nihon Flex Company and moving to a portable system with downgraded graphics. Had it continued on the PlayStation, as originally planned, the series could have met a different fate. Maybe. 
We don't know for sure. But when publishers like Square Enix get involved, the situation almost always gets worse. But that's all entirely subjective. We may not know what the future holds in, but at least today we learned what the hell happened to Lufia. You know, this plot hole of Nihon Flex, this weird company being involved with Lufia, still bugs me, still bothers me. And as much as I researched this whole thing on the internet, I found nothing. So if any of you guys know something about it, please let me know in the comment section below. Anyway, we learned today what the hell happened to Lufia. The same thing that happens to a lot of franchises, to a lot of companies, to a lot of developers. Same old situation. They failed, they were never really successful to begin with, bad decisions, lots of publishers, etc. The same thing over and over, time and time and again. That's what happened to Lufia. Thanks so much for watching, don't forget to subscribe and share this video with your friends. See you next time!